Good morning. It's Thursday, and this is the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee, and we are here today with Commissioner Josh Hanford from the Department of Housing and Community Development and Sean Gilpin, um, whose title he'll have to remind us of exactly. Um, I don't want to say everything else, um, but uh, we are going to hear from them uh, the, to give an explanation of what was in the governor's budget proposal, which was just released on Tuesday, um, and how it relates to the work that we do in this committee specifically about housing, um, but perhaps not limited to that. I think that there's some pretty, um, it was a pretty uh, different year for us in terms of the, the governor's proposal with housing, and I'm, I'm quite interested in hearing um, the each each appropriation and what the um, proposals are. Um, some of them we've heard of in our work so far this year. Some of them are quite related to um, COVID response or, and um, ongoing housing issues that we've been dealing with in our committee. So with that, with that we have them till about 1030. And so with that, um, I'll turn it over to you, Josh, and you and Sean can tag team as necessary. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, for the record, Josh Hanford, uh, Commissioner of Vermont Department of Housing and Community Development. And Sean, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself now for the record? Or might as well do the record record keeping. Uh, Sean Gilpin, uh, Housing Program Administrator is, is the, the title these days uh, with the Department of Housing and Community Development. And I'm glad um, um, we coordinated Sean and, and, and Chairman Stevens with our orange today. Um, <laughs> and so I guess I'll kick things off big picture and I can share my screen for, with some of the documents that uh, we shared with, with Ron that's, that's up on your committee page. Um, if that works, if I have share screen, let's see, I do, okay. Can folks see that? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is the, the big, big picture, um, uh, our, our infographic for the agency. And this is um, unheard of as far as our agency having this much of a, um, a support for new funding, most of it being one time. Um, but you know, during the last, during this existing fiscal year, our agency has already moved over $300 million of CARES funding. Um, so we know we can do it. Um, and we think these are priorities that make a lot of sense, um, address um, the need to recover from the pandemic first to help reemploy people and then to reinvest in uh, community development, in housing and, and the business. And I know, um, you know, this, this committee, we're going to focus on mainly the community uh, development investments and the housing for all investments. Um, but just wanted to give folks uh, uh, the big picture of what's going on here. And, um, and Commissioner, Commissioner, if I may just quickly interrupt, can you make that um, full screen somehow? It's a little tiny. Yeah, um, I agree. <laughs> And then, and I know we can, we can committee, we can see this on our, on our webpage too, if you want to follow along on, if you have another device that's not your phone. Um, and that commissioner, yeah. yes. And yeah, that's great. Um, and commissioner, can you give us a quick primer on the difference between one-time monies and, and just sort of standard baked in budget? Um, just so when we use that shorthand, we know what it means. I mean, when it comes to the money that comes to your uh, agency, it always strikes me as it feels, it always feels like one-time money because it's not, there's not a bottom line baked into to most of these um, things. It's usually based on available funds. Right. Um, so the first line there in recovery, the business uh, uh, assistance grants, that's in the budget adjustment right now. Um, as well as the everyone eats um, additional funding to continue that and to reuse um, some of the FEMA reimbursement to try to carry this program through the end of fiscal year 21. Um, 
and and then the the tourism and marketing um, and the buy local stimulus, those are both one time um, funds. J just FY twenty two. Um, much of this is one time. I'll highlight the differences as we go through. Um, the also just to clarify that the items shaded in orange are programs that won't be run through our agency, but it's in partnership with. Um, so just wanted to, to make that uh, comparison. The $500,000 for the Vermont Relocated Worker Grant Program, this is proposed to be base funding. Um, you'll notice in this big investment, there actually isn't a lot of direct support for businesses. Most of it's indirect, you know, creating the, the ecosystem and infrastructure to help businesses uh, thrive. Um, you know, we don't have the luxury of all that federal funding where we were doing direct, direct grants to, to businesses um, with state general fund dollars. So we, we've planned more for these investments in our communities that indirectly support the business climate as a better approach with general fund dollars. Um, but the $500,000 there is sort of a combining of two popular programs that were really um, created out of uh, Senator Sorokin's committee over the last few years, where it was the remote worker and the um, where it was enticing folks to come here and remote work remotely for a company anywhere in the country or the world for that matter. And then the second year of the program recognized that we have Vermont employers that can't find workers. And, you know, we ought to be helping folks um, move here to take jobs in Vermont companies. And this combines both of those programs and allows for the, the agency to reward folks moving here for both remote work and for Vermont companies. And it, it, it helps cover moving costs and, and, and very specific items like that to, to, for, to help folks make the move here, take a job and uh, help change our demographics. Um, but I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the um, economic development stuff. Um, the reinvestments in community, these, many of these, um, well, not many, but some of these do support our housing goals. Um, you know, the first one doesn't have a general fund cost. It's this place-based uh, increment financing. So it's often referred to as a mini TIF. We don't like to use that term because some folks um, either hate or love TIF, um, the way it, it is funded and, and the results um, produced from TIF financing. But this is to help very discreet small projects use this model. You know, we have story after story of different small communities in Vermont that know they need more housing in their village. They know they have a few businesses that could expand, but they need um, sewer and water uh, infrastructure in place in their village to make that happen. There is just not enough capacity for private septic and wells. And that expense spread out over few, so few users is just impossible for the communities to bond against. So this is meant to address that. And we have a number of case studies where communities have worked on this issue for 20, 30 years and they've gotten nowhere and they need the ability to use this TIF model where they can um, plan for future development and take the, the uh, increased tax revenue off of that to help pay their, their debt that they're absorbing. Otherwise the users on those systems will never be able to afford that cost. And so that does speak to housing creation a lot in, in some of our um, rural communities, but having dense core, I see a, a hand up. I don't know if you want me to address that as we go or, or go through however you, you'd like. Um, I think in this particular case, Josh, with you, uh, Commissioner, with you uh, referring, you're taking pauses where you can. So if you see a hand up and you want to and, and address it, that would be great. Um, cause if I'm traffic copying, I'm waiting for you to have a pause, but, um, yes, if you see a hand up, go right ahead. Sure. Uh, looks like representative Toronto question. Uh, no, that hand was left up when I was looking to get the screen a little bit larger. Sorry, Josh. Oh, sorry. Um, the next one is modernization of act 250. You know, we've been talking about this for a long time that we really feel that in our downtowns, cores in our village centers, 
we should ref reform Act 250. Um, the, the fact that you can have a, um, neighbors appeal desperately needed affordable housing projects, the, those application fees are quite expensive. And um, we know that this uh, Act 250 um, stops housing projects, affordable housing projects. You know, when we have the investments in place and the infrastructure and Act 250 is triggered at eight or more units, it's not wise investment of our resources. And we've been working on this for a long time. So um, that's what that one's about. The Better Places grant program, this was an initiative that was sort of started during the pandemic. It was called Better Places, Safer Spaces. It sort of made it almost to the finish line with CRF money, but it wasn't funded. And what happened was the uh, uh, philanthropic community in Vermont said, we really like this. We think this is what our communities act desperately need. And so you had groups like the Vermont Arts Council, Preservation Trust, um, uh, Vermont um, Community Foundation, others that raised their own money. And they partnered with our team at the department and said, you do such good work with this. We've raised our own private money, but we want you to select the communities and the projects because this is what you do. And so we've carried out this program with a simple $100,000 and we've received over like 40 applications requesting more than a couple million. Um, and so this was ripe for, um, you know, th this, this budget that we have so much extra money in to sort of take this program on and really help communities revitalize their public spaces um, in their downtowns and villages. Think of, you know, empty parking lots and parklets and bump outs uh, on front of your restaurants and you know, really, we need to encourage people to get back to these places when um, when this pandemic's over. I don't know about you, but I've been in some of our our communities, and you know, the activity is just not there like it was. You know, the restaurants are dark most of the time, and there's just a lack of, of vibrancy. And this is an attempt to bring that back with this money. Um, the downtown transportation fund. You know, this is an existing program. This is a you know. 10 time increase to what's normally supported in one time funding. The better places is one time funding. Um, and this is to really help uh, sort of make communities more walkable, biking, transit, uh, you know, park and rides. This is a partnership with Department of Trans uh, Agency of Transportation. The money actually comes out of their budget and they sort of funnel it to us through our downtown board to award projects. And it's been a successful program so far. And then the next one is expand the downtown tax credit program by an ongoing increase of 1.75 million, bringing it up to 4.75 million and uh, change the statute to allow this funding to um, be eligible in neighborhoods. Right now it's only eligible in the designated downtowns and village centers, which are very small. If you look on our maps, you know, most people think, oh, that must mean the whole developed area. It's not. You know, you, you look at the downtown Montpelier or Waterbury or Barrie, and it is just a teeny ring around the commercial core Main Street. It doesn't expand at all into the historic neighborhoods. This would allow an expansion into the neighborhoods. It's a very low barrier program. You know, you as a private owner of the property submit an application to do code improvements facade improvements, sprinkler, ADA, all that sort of uh, work is eligible. You do the work with your own money and then you get a reimbursement, a partial reimbursement. And it's proven to be very successful. Projects big and small take advantage of this. You know, most of the affordable housing, big affordable housing developments that are doing rehab work because they have to be historic properties take advantage of this. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, all of the, you know, mom and pop store, general stores and other sort of um, main street businesses take advantage of this program all across the state. So it's a uh, it's a really successful program that we want to move into the historic neighborhoods and allow those rental property owners to take advantage of, of this. I see a question from Representative Clackey. Thank you, Josh. And th this is a, a a great presentation and better places. Thank you, thank you, thank you on that. Um, I have a question on the one we're talking about right now, the expanded downtown tax credit. Um, last term, uh, this committee looked at a bill, uh, uh, 
encouraging more inclusionary housing and not, will that be embedded in this expansion of downtown tax credits? Excellent question. The, you know, part of that bill passed in S-237 last year, but some of the more, um, I guess I would say, mandatory changes were sort of stripped out of it. Um, but what this does by virtue of allowing incentives in these areas, you have to go through a planning process to get a neighborhood designated area approved. In order to get that approved, you have to at least allow four um, units per, per lot. And, and it's an encouraging aspect here where communities choose to say, hey, we want this designation for our, neighbor, for our particular neighborhoods. They apply to the downtown board. It's a planning process with their planners, with our planning staff. They get the designation and, and to get that designation, they have to uh, adopt some of these more inclusionary zoning um, requirements and some density. And once they have that, the proposal here would then make those property owners eligible for these very valuable tax credits to improve their properties. Okay, thank you. Yep. I see um, a hand up from Representative Waltz. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner, on the same item. I just want to make sure I'm understanding it. Uh, is the total proposed allocation 4.75? Um, the existing allocation is um, 3 million right now. So this would be a 1.75 million increase ongoing. So the total would be 4.75. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. The next item is um, more money for brownfield cleanup, and this would be split between the Agency of Natural Resources and ACCD. You know, there's an existing program, um, but this is a, a that, that leverages federal funds from the EPA and, and, and the, what the regional planning commissions receive. And we have a revolving loan fund for this in our agency. This would boost the funding substantially because the reality is we have, you know, way too many, probably hundreds of brownfields in our communities across the state, you know, in our already built up urban core that are properties that can't be used and they should be redeveloped. And, but brownfield um, cleanup is very expensive. It has lots of liability concerns. And this is an attempt to, you know, really free up those properties so we can redevelop them. And the difference between a and R's uh, share and ours is, you know, a &R, um, might uh, support cleaning up some of these properties just because they should be cleaned up for public health reasons, where our money is focused on the redevelopment aspect. It has to have a redevelopment plan and, and our, our funds is to help that plan. And much of these brownfield properties are turned into housing. Um, and so it, it does relate to, to housing uh, development. I see another question from uh, Representative Toronto. Yes, thank you. Um in Mindenville, there's a uh, really large uh, shuttered motel that would um, really um, go a long way in, in helping with housing, especially in Lindenville, St. Johnsbury area. Um, however, when I suggested anything be done with it, I was told it was in the floodplain. Uh, is there are there any funds in this um, uh, section, this piece that could help mitigate something like that? Huh. Um, I don't think that would qualify as a brownfield. I think the challenge with the floodplain issues is there are uh, exemptions for existing properties to still be redeveloped if they're in a floodplain. Uh -huh. You know, most most communities have changed their um, you know zoning and their development uh, you know bylaws to to not allow any new development in a floodplain for very good reasons. But the fact is we have a lot of built environment infrastructure in floodplains, so you can still do that, but um, extra mitigation is usually required. Um, that would be covered with existing sort of housing development funds or other funds. Those would be eligible expenses, but I don't believe this brownfield funding would really um, uh, be eligible for, for that. Okay, thank you. Representative Murphy. Thank you. Um, following on that, and I'm sorry, it's a little bit off this topic, but with the floodplain piece, weren't there properties that after um, Irene, people were given monies, but you relinquish the, the ability to develop? Because the point is we keep redeveloping property that, um, you know, is in a floodplain. And so 
in essence, it's it's temporary <laughs> expenditure. You're going to be spending the money again when it floods out. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I was heavily in, involved in that. Uh, we managed about $40 million in disaster recovery funds from the um, uh, CDBG program, disaster recovery. And our biggest single program was buyouts, property buyouts, both commercial and home ownership. Um, the reality was where there was many more homes that were bought out. I think about 146 all across the state, including one small mobile home park that were in the floodplain, in, in the flood um, way in some cases. And it's a much smarter investment to buy those properties out at full, at full market value so that they can per, you know, have enough resources to go and, and purchase a new home in a safer place. And then the property is cleaned up, turned over, with a permanent easement for no more development. You can do recreational um, uses on the property. And we developed a whole series of, um, of public parks. Um, you know, the White River Valley was really epicenter of a lot of the flooding. Um, and there was about 14 parks created now that uh, were homes along the river, you know, that you can, you can picnic at and you can, you know, pull over in your canoe. And it's really created a tremendous resource out of what was a uh, you know, a, a disastrous situation. And everyone agrees that we need to move away from those areas because we keep putting money in. But the fact is, you know, our roads, our bridges, our, our downtowns are in these areas. And so those built environments, we have to protect. We just don't want to build any more out in the rural, rural areas. Thank you. The next one, the broadband, if it's okay with you, I'm not gonna go into the detail on this. I think this there's so much um, <laughs> to talk about with broadband and it's a little outside of my wheelhouse. So I'm, I'm gonna um, just say that, that this is in partnership with Department of Public Service to deploy this. Um, the next area really is the one that I, I hope we'll talk the most about. And this doesn't include all of the housing investments. We have a couple other pieces um, uh, attached to your committee page that we'll go over, Sean and I, that are um, are sort of white papers on these proposals. But these are, you know, the three big ones. Um, we have our VHIP, our Vermont Housing Investment Program, um, coming back to you with lessons learned from the CRF funding that you helped us deploy. Um, we can give you uh, much more detail on that, but um, feel it's been very successful and the numbers will prove that out. This is an increase um, to that program with 1 million proposed as base funding ongoing, and then um, 3 million as one-time funding since we have this um, you know, in influx of, of, of extra budget uh, revenue for next year. And it's split up between um, uh, rental upgrades, you know, existing vacant blighted code deficient rental properties, as well as a home ownership rehab purchase rehab component that we'll get into more detail. The next program is, a, is an increase of an existing uh, successful program funded with tax credits through the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. They sell those tax credits and award the proceeds to the Champlain Housing Trust, which runs the Manufactured Home Replacement Program. And so what you have here is you have, um, and this really helps folks in, in much of the rural parts of Vermont that, you know, um, affordable housing often in, in, in rural settings is uh, someone's mobile home, you know, on own land or in a mobile home park. And those mobile homes, the older style mobile homes, you know, they depreciate in value over time. and um, they're energy inefficient, and they often don't work well for a rehab investment. It's just not worth it. What this does is it allows those folks to um, purchase a new Energy Star mobile home or a zero energy manufactured home as a replacement, and it provides a 0% um, deferred silent second that acts as a down payment loan. And it ranges from about $25,000 to $35,000, depending if you're buying an Energy Star home or a, a Zem modular, the zero energy uh, homes. And it is um, no, no payments, no interest. But when you sell or transfer that property, that loan is paid off and it recycles back to Champlain Housing Trust. And this program has become self-funding, self 
sustaining after six or seven years that we've, we've run it and we have some great statistics on it. You know, it's helped over 219 homes be purchased every County in the state. And this is more than doubling the ongoing tax credit to that program. Um, you know, increasing about 46 additional homes to that program with this infusion um, and re really hope this is something we can get through um, ways and means in particular, you know, um, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll look at this closely, but we think it's um, a, a valuable uh, program, both from helping safe housing for folks and also, you know, addressing the climate change issue um, for folks. So. Good. Uh, Commissioner, I can't raise my hand with, I can't raise my little yellow hand. Um, two quick questions. Um, related to this, with the similar kind of self-sustaining qualities was the first time home buyers program um, that VHFA ran. And I know that we had to work hard to get some funding into it in order to make it self-sustainable because just the way that it works, the money goes out and then it comes back. And, and as you said, keeps being recycled. Is there any proposal that you are aware of that may increase that program? Um, I, I'm not, that program was just increased last year or the year before. I'm trying to remember um, it had a bump in the ongoing tax credits for, for that program. And it, once again, it's very successful. It, it's a little smaller incentive, you know, it's about five or $6,000. And it, what it really covers is all of the, the closing costs and, and all of that as part of a, a purchase to help with the, the down payment expenses. And, um, you know, I, I totally agree. It, it's a worthy effort. Um, I think that what is different about this is that most of the other proposals in the housing realm are focused on more of those uh, existing neighborhoods, the developed areas. And this is the one item that really helps some of the very rural parts of the state where um, living in mobile homes that are uh, um, unhealthy and energy inefficient is really very common. And if we're gonna meet our energy goals and um, help these folks um, continue to have that affordable housing, a program like this needs to be increased uh, or we're gonna fall behind. And so committee, we will be having um, some, a, a training, if you will, on mobile homes in Vermont. They are uh, essential parts of our affordable housing stock. And it's a complicated, it's, it's a very complicated uh, world that, the, that, it, that it operates in. So we will, we will hear more about that um, in due time. Josh, I wanted to, and I also, the committee, I also wanted to point out in the, uh, the Vermont Housing Investment Program, this is something that uh, has been passed in concept or discussed heartily in concept. It actually passed once through this committee on a bill that didn't make it um, further. And last year we were considering a bill that, that we may refer to as H739 until there's a replacement that has to do with enforcement and using the Department of Public Safety. We had lengthy conversations about that last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and VHIP was one of the sections of that. And it the legislation itself was um, uh, kind of halted a little bit by COVID, but the idea of the VHIP program was implemented through the CRF funds um, in a slightly different in a slightly different way than what's being proposed. But the commissioner also proposed has some language that we will um, consider uh, as part of the new H seven thirty nine as well, um, and we'll get more details on the success of that program and and some of the some of the issues that may have arisen with that, but um, very, again, very, very nice to see the difference between saying, well, this is, could be a great program if we could get funded at a million dollars base to saying, well, we can actually get the base and have, you know, because of, because of the um, budget surplus right now. So, um, so we'll, we'll be discussing that program again. Excellent. And then the last one on this line item is, you know, very, very exciting to the increase of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, a, a substantial increase, uh, more than $20 million. Um, you know, be, we, property transfer tax is up and this uh, fully allocates uh, all that it, it is um, 
is in legislation um, for VHCB, as well as some general fund on top of that, um, you know, bringing up to almost $31 million. Um, you know, this right now is, is proposed as one time uh, additional funding. Um, and, you know, I suspect you'll, you'll chat with, um, with Gus and, and Jen about more of that. We, we've chatted about, you know, a goal of this funding, this one time large increase to, to mainly go towards housing, considering um, the, the, you know, need we've all seen with um, need for more units right now. You know, we have folks still living in motels and hotels and the homeless situation, and we have tremendous resources to pay for rental assistance and support services. We just need units. And so that's really the emphasis behind this. And um, we have some ongoing conversations with um, VHCB and, and trying to partner on uh, the VHIP program and some of the home ownership elements of that with VHCB. And so I think there's a lot of really exciting work that can happen um, if this budget comes to pass and these resources are available to all of us and our you know, very coordinated housing network, what we can really accomplish um, uh, with this sort of resource uh, in the private sector and with our nonprofit partners it's really a once in a, it's certainly my, my, my lifetime so far uh, career, you know, opportunity to see these sort of resources um, realized. I see a question from Representative Clackey. Uh, thank you, Josh, and th th it is tremendous. Um, thank you for this uh, proposal. Where does the, uh, I'm just wondering for our, this housing ban that we're looking at, does the 200 million in this next round of COVID relief funds is that in here at all in this, or where does that live? No, that, that doesn't live in here um, because it's, it's, the reality is that 200 million already has a program. It's a federal program called the Emergency Rental Assistance Program with very clear parameters, eligibility and requirements. And, you know, we need to submit a, a, a one, a receipt of federal grant award and um, the governor has to approve that and it has to go to the joint fiscal office for acceptance. Um, there are work across a couple other committees to maybe dole out smaller portions of that 200 million to get, to get things started. But the reality is it's not in our view, a part of the um, big budget bill. It, it can't wait until that passes. It, has time limits. We have to spend 65% of it by the end of September. And it's a defined federal program, much like the CDBG or the home program or others that say, here's the rules. Do you want this money or not? And so um, it's, we, we did not include it for a number of reasons in uh, the governor's proposal, least of which is to confuse folks that that money was flexible for other um, ineligible uses. And so I think there could be a lot more talk about that um, as we move forward. Yeah, I, 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 uh, the thing I, I, I just wonder about is, you know, the, the renovation of the apartments in that is incredible. The success of that has been great. And um, I, I think we've seen the success in uh, utilizing our Corona relief fund money in the housing, but I, I guess I worry a little bit about, uh, so we have that money for rental and utility arrearages, which is very important, but I'm not sure we have any additional money to protect um, foreclosures on mortgages. And I just think that that's also an upcoming issue that we, we, we spent not significant money, but we spent some money and right now that doesn't fit anywhere. Is that because the Vermont Housing Conservation Board would not support to helping with mortgages? Is that correct? So, so I, I won't speak for them on that, but I will say that um, you're right, that 200 million does not include mortgage assistance or foreclosure prevention. Yeah. However, it does allow 10% for other housing supports and services that we're trying to um, seek maximum flexibility on what that means. It could support some of our housing partners, um, the homeownership centers, and maybe provide some counseling that can help um, 
you know, perhaps lower income homeowners at, at least have a voice, you know, um, pushing back against their, their mortgage servicer to, to delay things or take advantage of any um, forbearance agreements or anything out there. Perhaps the other, the good news though, is that in the um, new proposal coming from the Biden administration, um, which is going to have Congress acting fast on it, there's a whole nother slug of housing resources proposed um, in there. And in that proposal, there is um, homeownership mortgage um, support. So we're hopeful that that'll come soon. What we don't want to do is delay this emergency rental assistance, and it goes forward. That rental assistance is oh, both for arrearages. Yeah. yeah. No, no, and, I, um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm actually talking about the, the 38 million now. I, I understand totally the, two, the 200 million because could mortgage, mortgage foreclosure support help? Could that be embedded in that $38 million? The VHCB, the VHCB yes. funding? Well, I know VHCB helps home ownership. Um, you know, usually it's about um, unit creation. Yeah. You know, um, supporting, you know, they, they, they support a lot of the um, uh, homeland grants, the shared equity housing development, yeah. um, you know, and they have the authority to help um, homeowners up to 120%. But I, I'm not sure um, that they would, they would propose using the funding in that way. Um, you know, and I, I don't want to speak, speak no, for them. No, I, I think- I understand. Okay. I think you raise a good point. If we have a, a foreclosure crisis that um, pops up and we don't have resources coming for months down the road, how do we best prevent that? Because once someone loses their home, it's a lot more expensive to find a new situation than dealing with covering a few months of, of missed uh, mortgage payments. Absolutely. So good, good, good thinking for sure. All right. Thank you, Josh. Representative Hongo. Yeah, good morning. Thank you. Um, I also share concerns about the mortgage um, issue, foreclosure issue, but that's another story <laughs> for another time. Um, my question is if you could just briefly tell us um, the administration's priorities for home ownership for the BIPOC community. Can you tell me where um, in this? overview that lies yes i i will um i don't know if you are seeing the screen change as i flip are you seeing yes a different view right now yes okay um i think it was about time to transition anyways um that larger agency-wide view the rest was um not was was not housing related so i think this is what sean and i want to talk with you most about today is our vhip um, program proposal and what is different about um, what we discussed over the last few years. Um, and, and much of this is lessons learned from the CRF money. Um, you know, right now with that CRF money, uh, about 200 units are already complete and most of them have families moved in. You know, that was work done in six months. Um, we have, by the time I say late February gets here, early March, we'll be up to about 250 units uh, from that program, um, you know, completed and families moved in, um, many of them being um, uh, folks referred from the continuum of care, folks moved out of the uh, um, motels and hotels, Department of Corrections, um, folks that are being released into the community need a safe home, a whole host of great things, not to mention a new found collaboration between um, the home ownership centers, the continuum of cares, and a whole bunch of new private landlords that um, had not been coordinated um, in, in this system for ongoing uh, work here. So what we found is we have very willing partners out there that have um, vacant apartments that they are losing money on by having them vacant. but. They have very expensive repairs, you know, asbestos, knob and tube wiring, you know, uh, furnaces, they're 80, 90 years old. Um, I don't know if anyone got a chance to view any of the, the video from NeighborWorks of Western Vermont with some of the landlords, um, but you can see the condition of some of these properties 
you know, and then you, you, you talk about, you know, insulation and weatherization and, you know, safe egress windows and lead paint. And, um, it, it, it is no wonder that, um, there are properties that aren't serving the community and aren't serving folks in need when they're in this condition and it's so expensive to upgrade them. So those lessons are, are uh, applied to this new form of VHIP, super VHIP, um, as, as Chairman Stevens referred to it once. Um, and the rental rehab component um, brings that newfound um, lessons learned by upping the, the amount uh, uh, available, putting additional conditions on. But your specific question, Representative Hongo, is about the the homeowner purchase rehab component, which is the million dollars, um, which is base in our budget. Um, and it has a 25% uh, minority um, ownership set aside. I, I might like to refer to it uh, more as a, a target because um, I don't think uh, to comply with fair housing, you know, we'll be able to simply sit on money and not let anyone apply if there's a balance. But what we'll do is aggressively target market outreach to community members um, so that we have applications from this group that are, are such that they will be able to use that full uh, target. Um, that's our plan. And, and you know, some folks have mentioned that the housing opportunities that are targeted for this funding, because what we're really trying to do here is two things, increase home ownership, um, allow folks that are paying rent to move into their own home, build wealth and equity, and really pay the same amount that they were paying for rent. In order to do that, you need to find homes that are relatively affordable, and those exist. I There are uh, um, a number of homes in, you know, Barry and Springfield and St. John's Barry and, you know, Rockingham and Bennington and Rutland. I mean, the list goes on. These are our old, these are our older um, industrial communities in Vermont that really built the Vermont we know. And those historic neighborhoods are full of these homes um, and they can be purchased for eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000. But the fact is they have serious deferred maintenance. They need a real rehabilitation and weatherization. And so this is targeted for those homes, um, those opportunities where there'd be a, a small amount of this up to $50,000 grant that would be available to help with the down payment assistance and closing costs. But that's also capped in here. Um, we want the majority of this funding to go to the rehab because there are other sources for down payment assistance and, and, and silent second loans. But there isn't a source for this immediate uh, rehab grant. You know, you don't have banks that are willing to lend to a home in this condition that can't pass code in home inspections. And on top of the mortgage, give them a, a, another loan to fix it up. That's just too risky. So that's what we're after. And, you know, we've been, um, it's, it's been brought to our attention, you know, that uh, if you're talking about, you um, uh, people of color in Vermont, you know, there's many that live in, in, in Chittenden County and that that might be hard to find a home um, in Chittenden County that fits this this sort of model. It, that, that very well may be true, but I think there are opportunities out there. And then we can't forget that indigenous communities in Vermont, the Abenaki community, which do live in many of the rural areas across the state, and have for centuries not enjoyed the same wealth, home ownership. Um, and we've heard, I've spoken with Chief Stevens and others in this community that also, you know, really value this, this effort here. Um, so we think this is uh, um, uh, about time we, we start to do something like this and focus on this housing stock and help uh, folks build wealth and help, um, uh, reinvest in these communities that really built the Vermont that we know and have kind of been left behind the last 20 years. So I'll stop there. And Thank Josh, you. Josh, and Josh, if I could just again cut in before John, just the when we look at the historical the references that you make here about how difficult it has been to 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 get equity um, to to the BIPOC community, uh, do we? Do we still have any remnants in our financial laws that you're that you're aware of in the in the in 
you know, the deeper, sometimes, sometimes legislation, sometimes statute is still there, even though we don't practice it, but it's still there. Do, are you aware of, of any barriers that is still exist in the, in our bank's lending processes? Um, you know, so, so I have talked with the, um, Susanna Davis and their uh, subcommittee recommendations on housing. Um, and I would say from, from their research, there isn't specific um, direct sort of uh, racial barriers called out, but what there is, is traditional sort of banking and credit laws that work against folks that haven't been able to build wealth and equity, you know, that and we can't change, we can't tell um, mortgage lenders to ignore credit scores. Um, they rely on these longstanding, um, you know, uh, sort of to protect their interests. And, you know, they, they, they're not going to stop checking credit scores. They're not going to stop checking some of those. That's why we need a program like this to set the, to, to, to sort of balance, um, you bring more equality, you know, things being equal aren't the same if you've never had a chance to earn a good credit score, but yet that's what your mortgage is going to be based on. And, you know, um, some folks have brought up, um, you know, arrest records, criminal backgrounds, and, and, you know, that might be a higher proportion. And, you know, there, there's things that are being worked on in that front, especially in, you know, marijuana sort of expungement of records and so forth. But, um, it's a great question. I, I feel that I'm I'm not um, as equipped to 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 dive in and, and give you um, the most educated response. But we do know that um, some of the existing ways you evaluate risk as a financial institution do work against this community. It's not um, specifically racist at this point, like it certainly was, and and we have federal history of, of this, um, but it still works against this community that hasn't been able to take advantage of the systems um, to this point. Thank you. Representative Kalaki. Thank you, Chair. Um, Josh, could you help, uh, help me understand what opportunity neighborhoods uh, throughout, sure. because I, I worked a lot with the refugee uh, Vermont uh, refugee resettlement program and certainly a lot of uh, first generation new Americans actually want to live in clusters of people from their their home countries as well as family and so Winooski and Burlington certainly have a large proportion of people but will are there opportunity neighborhoods does that factor into this as well or how is that defined? It, opportunity neighborhoods is not a defined term. It was um, my way of explaining, you know, what 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 these neighborhoods um, are like, and it was loosely based off of the opportunity zones that the state went through a pretty extensive process to designate for that federal uh, program. And Vermont, um, it was you know looking at uh, demographics, um, income. Uh, poverty rate, and there are opportunity zones, but they cover whole communities. And this is really focused on the neighborhood level. And um, I, I'm pretty sure I can check because we have it on our website, all these 23 opportunity zone communities. I'm pretty sure Winooski is one of them. And I'm pretty sure um, part of Burlington is. Okay. Um, but it would also include the very same communities I'm talking about, like Springfield, Bells Falls, Bennington, Rutland, St. Johnsbury, that have um, a demonstrated, um, you know, sort of decline in, in um, you know, home values in some of the neighborhoods, you know, low, higher poverty rates that um, we want to invest and provide more opportunity there for folks. Um, it's really hard to compete and help someone that's lower income buy a new home in Shelburne. It just is. You're going to need twice as, three times as much um, uh, uh, subsidy to make that happen. Um, but no, yet no, I, we have. It's great. I, I, so, thank you. I, I just was, I didn't want us to be encouraging dispersion of communities. You know? No. No, I have to move out. It's great. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. 
So I don't see any other questions. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, Representative. That's all right. The, no problem. Um, I'm just, I, I just, uh, this is a um, really practical question. So <clears throat> there's $4 million in VHIP um, or slated to be in VHIP. And you, uh, you said split between rental and purchase rehabilitation. So is that two and two or um, is it one and three? And I'm wondering what portion, what does 25% actually represent in terms of money? And what does that actually translate into in terms of, um, um, you know, in, individual families or households that, that could be, take advantage of this? Sure, yeah, you, yeah. Um, you, you're diving into this, some of the specifics that, you know, we, we hope to maybe work through with you with our, with our draft bill and, and um, you know, some of this is uh, up for a little bit of um, input fr fr from you folks, certainly. Um, so there's a million designated for this new homeowner purchase and rehab program, but it's ongoing. Um, and it's the smaller amount because it's a pilot. It's new. It's not an existing program. We have to stand it up. We have to prove that it works. And, and so from just a risk perspective, um, you know, it has a small, it has a smaller allocation, you know, the, the VHIP rental side, we've already got a system in place. We already have partners. We are, we're ready to go. And so we know we can move more money quicker and, and more beneficiaries. Whereas this has to be created really from the ground up. Um, there's a few small test pilots in this, this realm um, across the state that we've, we've looked at their proposals and sort of developed some of the basics for this. Um, but it has to it has to start from the ground up. So we didn't want to throw too much into it. But the good news is this is proposed in the governor's budget as the ongoing funding. So it would be ongoing a million, and we would you know build up momentum. And also this would be um, you know uh, developing an ongoing source of in itself as we've designed this program. The fifty thousand um, dollar benefit to help folks purchase and rehab these homes would act as a 0% deferred silent second. And so when the home was sold, that money would return back to the program and be, uh, you know, ongoing source for this funding. It'll take, you know, several years before that's a meaningful amount that, that helps this revolve, but, but that's the hope. And so, you know, at $50,000 a piece, um, you know, with a million dollars, you can kind of do the math. There's going to be some uh, overhead that we're, you know, we're going to have to work with our nonprofit partners, um, the homeownership centers, uh, possibly VHFA and others to run this. Um, you know, we're a housing staff of, of, of two <laughs> in our department, three. Um, so we work with partners um, and, you know, they'll need some operating to, to carry this out. Um, so I hope that answers the question, it, you know, because we don't have, we didn't put specifics in of, of exact uh, beneficiaries or such in our draft legislation. It's, it's, it's outlined the, the concept um, that we hope to, you know, work with you on and, and help refine based on, you know, your own uh, input and, and thoughts. But it's more the, the concept that we want to get support for. Thank you. Nope, there's other no, questions. Josh, my, yeah, just being mindful of time of your time, Josh. It's um, it's almost ten after ten, so we are just um, you know, let us know where where you need to be. Yeah, maybe um, what I would do is maybe ask Sean to um, pop on and give you uh, a little bit more detail on what we've done with VHIP so far on the the rental assistance the rental um, rehab side and um, give you a little bit more detail on the, the tweaks we've made in our proposal here based on what we did with CRF funding, if that, if that works for the committee. Sure. Uh, and just before you do that, I just want to put a bookmark on a question that I want to follow up with you on um, that is related to the uh, use of the property transfer tax for the municipal, uh, for the RPCs, for the municipal planning grants. Um, I certainly 
am heartened and and floored by by the ability, as you've mentioned earlier, to have a full complement of, of PTT going to the Housing Conservation Trust Fund. I'm just curious to know whether or not this other small chunk, it's not small really, but this other chunk, which has been traditionally underfunded as well, um, is that also getting any improvement in their funding or are there other funds that might be available to the RPCs to, uh, I mean, the testimony we took last year was capacity is also a huge issue for them. So when we ask them to change their zoning, we need to be able to provide the funds to help them um, hire people to help them. So did, did that happen this year or is, are there gonna be funds available that we can we'll let our RPCs know that are gonna be available? Uh, great, great question. In, in this proposal, the governor's budget, it does not propose a base increase to those two um, funds from the property transfer tax. But I will say that, it, you know, if you look on that, um, the larger proposal from just the agency, our agency, many of those programs will be um, done in coordination with those groups and that they will um, benefit from those funds by administering the grants, running those programs, you know, doing the work they do um, and receiving pass through funds um, as I envision. So if, if there's one thing that that uh, infographic that our agency proposed in programs here with one time money is it's, it's direct programs that are going to benefit. It's not investments in organizational infrastructure because it's one time money. And the governor was really clear about a concern of, of, increasing that overall permanent capacity and not having the resources down the road to keep it up. And so it's all about these programs uh, creating immediate benefits for Vermont communities now, and that the RPCs um, will be partners in that work and will, as I anticipate, be receiving grants to actually implement these programs and therefore be receiving administrative dollars to implement these programs um, during the same time frame. So it's kind of an indirect answer, but uh, I, I think it works. No, and I'll, we'll follow up on that too. Thank you. So Sean, do you wanna um, give a overview um, on um, VHIP uh, results under the CRF and how we incorporated those lessons learned into this proposal and I can maybe stop sharing my screen so we can all, all see each other again? Sure, um, gladly. So um, yeah, as folks know, and at risk of um, you know confusing everything, because we love to uh, make new names for stuff, uh, the VHIP proposal is one that has been um, largely uh, introduced, or has been introduced um, in the past, uh, as, as uh, Chairman Stevens mentioned. Um, and then using coronavirus relief funds, we actually created the, the rehousing recovery program, which um, was essentially a, a sort of super VHIP. Um, and that um, was, you know, as uh, I think the last time I was, I was in front of all you fine folks um, was talking about our partnership with the home ownership centers to bring uh, vacant and blighted units back online um, to address code uh, enforcement or, or code violations in, in um, those and in occupied units um, address those issues. And we, um, we have successfully um, to date brought nearly 218 units um, online uh, and are uh, just now uh, re, uh, uh, re, redoing the, uh, the grant amendments now that we have the uh, uh, extended deadlines for use of CRF funds with the homeownership centers and releasing the final amounts of uh, CRF funds that was allocated to them. So in the end, it'll, it'll end up being about a $7.6 million public investment that will bring close to 200 and between 240 and 250 units online um, in, a, in a manner of about, um, about uh, 10 months to, to, to a year. So um, pretty, pretty impressive for a, a scattered site project like this. Um, one of the requirements, um, as, you, as you folks know, uh, was that anybody, any benefiting property owner had to commit to at least a five-year affordability covenant whereby they couldn't rent the units for more than um, the HUD fair market rent, um, or uh, in other words, basically what somebody with a, with a housing choice or Section 8 voucher um, 
would would be able to afford. Um, so it kind of locked in for five years. Um, those units would be available in theory, at least for folks who um, were utilizing a housing choice voucher. We also required that the property owners coordinate with uh, the continuum of care, which is sort of our blanket term for the network of organizations that um, deal with um, Vermonters who are experiencing homelessness and try to assist them. We, uh, the way that we had originally set it up was that the property owners needed to, were required to at least uh, consider three referrals. Um, but then could ultimately make their own choice about who who to rent the unit out to at that at that affordable uh, affordable rental rate. What we um, we set that up because we thought that sort of mandating who was supposed to go into these units um, would lead to very little buy-in. Um, sort of uh, concerns about property owners feeling like they were being told who had to um, go into their into their privately owned units. We actually found out uh, through the homeownership centers that one of the um, and one of the intentional um, goals that we had was to create a line of communication between property owners and this network of homeless service providers. And we found out that one of the one of the sort of soft results of this on top of the you know sticks and bricks type stuff is that we we did actually see a lot more communication happening between uh, what we call the COCs. Uh, the continuum of care organizations and the property owners who benefited from this program. And the result is that the homeownership centers actually said that they were getting um, landlords uh, knocking at their door even after we kind of uh, temporarily halted the, the program while we figured out um, whether or not we were going to get the extension on, um, on the use of CRF funds. And so in conjunction with the homeownership centers, we actually, um, in this sort of final rollout of, of the last remaining CRF funds, we're going to be requiring that all property owners um, that go through this program uh, uh, actually choose a referral from the COC as opposed to just needing to, to sort of review them. So this is gonna help us get uh, you know, a number of units, probably anywhere from, from 25 to 35 units uh, going specifically to uh, folks who are either in the coordinated entry system or um, using, you know, general assistance motel vouchers or those sort of support services into uh, permanent housing. And um, that was actually a, a bit of a, a pleasant surprise for us that there was that much interest um, at the homeownership centers were confident that they could actually find property owners who are willing to uh, commit to that. So we've built that in as one of the lessons learned to this new VHIP program. And one of the benefits of the, the VHIP proposal that um, came out in the governor's budget address is that using general funds, we don't have the same uh, limitations that some of the coronavirus relief funds came with. Obviously not the, the time frame um, is, is a broader horizon. Uh, and also we, uh, we have the opportunity to create more of a revolving loan fund. So one of the things that we're going to do with the new VHIP is, which is in the, um, in the actual uh, statutory language that, that's being proposed and being reviewed in very, various places right now, um, is to set up sort of a tiered, uh, tiered option for property owners. So the, afford the same affordability covenants will be in place. Um, however, for those property owners who agree to taking referrals from the COCs um, for at least five years, um, and that would be either five years with one tenant or you know five years with however many turnovers there are during that during that amount of time, um, the funds would be seen as a grant. Um, for those who are not willing to commit to that five-year covenant or five-year uh, referral requirements, uh, it would be a deferred interest loan whereby. Um, 10% of the loan is forgiven for every year that they adhere to the affordability covenant. So what that would do is basically say, um, if, if you want it as a grant, you either have five-year commitment to affordability and referral from the um, coordinated uh, or for the continuum of care or 10 years of affordability covenant. And if at any point um, the property owner decides to switch from um, you know, the, the higher standard of uh, referral of, of homeless folks to um, just the affordability covenant, then the, uh, the, the grant would be, or the, the loan would be adjusted accordingly. Um, 
that sounds a little, perhaps a little complicated. Hopefully I did a, a decent enough job of, of simplifying that. But in short, what this does is um, basically locks in either five years of referral from uh, the uh, continuum of care. Um, so five years serving people who are exiting homelessness and or 10 years of affordability covenant. Um, and should the property be transferred at any time during that, um, then the money would be referred back to um, back to the program that could be readministered. Um, so with that, I will um, I'll, I'll take um, Representative Waltz. I think you were the first first hand raised. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm really interested in the VHIP program because of uh, in Barry City, we definitely have properties that qualify for this. I think it's very important. You answered a couple of my questions already, but I still have two more. All right. Uh, first of all, uh, the definition of online, does that mean occupied? Uh, uh, so online is in uh, we have how many units we've brought? Right. Online? You, say you that... brought, you know, 200, some odd, 218 units online. Does that mean that they're occupied or they're available? They are occupied. Fantastic. Yeah, they've been, they've been, they have, have tenants in them. Yes. Right. Okay. And thank you. My second question is, uh, I would love to see, I don't know if you have a, on your website, you have a, a distribution map of this activity. I would love to see how, how that's playing out around the state. Yeah, it's interesting. We, um, so I do not yet have a distribution map. Um, it's certainly something we've considered and actually um, NeighborWorks of Western Vermont on top of producing that video also managed to uh, create a distribution map of theirs. So I might be uh, talking with uh, Melanie Peskovich and, and the rest of uh, Ludi Biddle's team to see if they might uh, help me out in, in uh, expanding that to the other four homeownership centers. Well, thank you. I think that would be helpful for all of us to see what kind of impact we're having around the state. Thanks, Sean. Absolutely. Uh, Representative Murphy. Yes, thank you, Sean. I'm just curious when you spoke about the referrals in the first um, reference, it, it, you said that people could choose from three so they didn't feel that they were being told who they had to rent to. Does that continue to even if they do make that deeper commitment that it will definitely be a tenant from um, the, the organization, the I'm sorry, I'm missing out on Con continue of care. Thank you. The continue right. of care. Which to I be clear, it's, a, <laughs> it's a it's a it's a HUD term. So uh, don't don't blame us for the, uh, the 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 poor naming of it. Um, but the um, so the the commitment that we're talking about in this final um, final slug tranche, if you will, um, it would would require a um, some some sort of uh, referral for uh, the the acceptance of somebody who has been referred by the continuum of care. Um, with some exceptions, so there's there's some time frame limitations just so that we, we make sure um, units aren't being held open. But yes, and that is that is also the intention of the um, VHIP proposal um, to to have a five year commitment to the same um, same uh, entry process. Yeah, I, I, I understood that. I was just curious okay. if the, the landlord would be given a up to three names rather than just be told this is who you will rent to they would they would actually be able to choose from probably more than three it would it would okay. be up to a, a communication between the cocs to determine uh and the and the property owner to determine you know who and recognizing that there's there's a broad spectrum of individuals um that interact with a continuum of care from folks who have particularly checkered re re rental histories to you know folks who have who have just recently um, experienced their first bout of homelessness it's a, it's a big spectrum and, and there might be choices that need to be made based on various different neighborhood characteristics property characteristics and the like thank you sure um representative Kalaki, i think thank you john i i'm wondering uh we have uh, in this committee been asked to look at rental registries across the state mm -hmm. and it's not really moved through the committee at all but i wonder if something like that would actually benefit this program to really get the word out more broadly throughout the state and maybe then i mean it's a great success but even more successful or even if we want to then target different 
uh, parts of the state, you'd have a better map of the opportunities. Yeah, I, I think there are certainly a lot of potential benefits of, of having uh, better information on the location of our rental units and, and um, some of their characteristics. I suspect this committee will be hearing from the Rental Housing Advisory Board, um, which, which we staff, although are not um, technically, we don't have a seat on that board, um, but I work closely with those folks and um, we're actually meeting next week. Um, to talk about their uh, their ongoing intention for this legislative session, and uh, I suspect you folks will be seeing a a, uh, a proposal for a rental registry. Um, I would say that yes, it would have it would be helpful for this program, and would have been uh, particularly helpful for the rental housing stabilization program for the rent assistance. Um, sadly, I'm can look at a um, relatively short but not insignificant for those folks list of um, landlords who reached out to me um, after that program had closed having just heard about it for the first time despite all of our best efforts doing um, outreach everything from radio spots to um, you know working through Angela Zykowski's Vermont Landlords Association group and, and the like and it would have been uh, if if we could have um, you know for instance we did reach out directly to all the um, owners of mobile home parks um, to let them know about about that program and and allow them to assist their tenants with with applications for those who aren't able to pay lot rent um, because we have a registry of those but we do not of of regular um, uh, apartment units or other rental units okay thank you mm -hmm. uh, representative Troiano. thank you uh john um I guess I'm still a little curious as to how these referrals to the five-year covenant apartments are made. Uh, but, uh, who are they made by? How does the word get out? Is there some sort of underwriting or a guarantee when, you, when you're trying to place someone with a checkered, as you call checkered uh, rental history, which we all know about? Um, and, you know, how does that all come about that we can convince landlords to, uh, to take this on? Sure. So um, the the way we left it up largely to the home ownership centers to kind of negotiate that communication um, channel uh, with the um, many, many of the home ownership centers already had a relationship with, you know, groups in the area that that address just because of the shared mission of, of many of these groups. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, most of the home ownership centers send a representative to um, the Council on Homelessness, the Vermont Coalition to End Homelessness, the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. So there's there's a broad sort of um, grassroots, I guess you could say, communication network between a lot of these different different groups. Um, so it depended on um, on the existing relationships, and then and then some additional outreach. Um, I ended up doing a, a number of presentations about this program um, in front of you know these these various groups that have you know uh, mostly monthly meetings um, to to let them know that they should reach out to a particular point of contact at the home ownership center to sort of establish those lines of communication. So, um, and and from there, it, it's it's essentially between the private um, property owner and. Um, their point of contact at um, whatever appropriate uh, homeless service provider group is to um, sort of negotiate how those referrals come in and, and the like. Um, it's very, uh, very organic in that way, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, that's really good to hear. I wasn't aware of that. Thank you. Sean, I've got 1028. Are you all set for now or did we catch you up? I um I I think that's um I think that's all that I I had to share and and um, actually quite poignant that I will be jumping onto at ten thirty a call with the the Council on Homelessness to uh, present the same information to them so uh, just to uh, to Representative Triana's point there's uh, <laughs> quite a lot of communication going on. No well I appreciate um, you coming in I appreciate you coming in Commissioner. Uh, many miles to go. Um, we recognize that that what you presented is the governor's proposal. It's it's um, there's a lot of really good points in it, and we look forward to using it as a starting point in our work as well. So um, I, I appreciate your advocacy for these programs. I know you've worked hard. I know you've both worked hard to make sure that these programs. Um, I, one of the things with the VHIP program is that it's always a concern is using state money and what's the what's the payback and you know to try to arrange these um, 
periods of time where the where the apartments remain available is it's an important piece of the puzzle without going into the perpetual affordability which happens with our with our other um, money that goes to the non usually to the nonprofit uh, build uh, developers so so trying to walk a fine line on being able to help the private side what with public money in a way that has a public return and certainly 218 apartments right now is 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 a really good start so thank you um, Thank you. And we'll, yeah, we'll have you in again, I'm sure, as, as, this, um, as this continues. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Um, committee, we are about to start uh, changing gears here to uh, H63 and H81. Um, we're turning a corner on, on, this, on these pieces of legislation, and we're going to start heading in, in, a, in a straighter direction with them. But let's take a break first. Um, I think we earned a seven minute break today.